Hey, y'all. Welcome to the Heal Moon Realness Podcast, spotlighting badass conversation wranglers with the refinement to impact thought. <laughs> <laughs> through every experience, either through kindness or through pain, we are finding ways to navigate how to include rather than exclude. And we do it through these human realness stories from kindness, empathy, advocacy, and love. And my guest today is definitely celebrating her own badassness by teaching us when to be holy, when it's time to be educated, and knowing when it's time to be the motherfucker. So Dr. Nicole Price, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate you inviting me. Yeah. You got the puppies. I got the puppies. Luca and Leo. They don't ever sit with me. I mean, what is going on right here? So let's just go through some housekeeping. Ready? Ready. They're going to stay there because they love people. Okay. They love, and we've made sure in our household, everyone is welcome. The problem is a little too welcome with these two, and that one will start snoring. Okay. Well, I'll just do a little we want to make sure or something. We want to make sure it's not a toot or anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I might not be able to focus. So I'll be sure to clarify. I'm like, that was not a toot. That was a doggy snore. That was a doggy snore. That was okay. a do- doggy All snore. Right. So I first want to start out like I, how we met. And we were just talking about this a little bit ago. And how we met and how I come to know you was around it was march of last year around yep around and that time you had i watched i can't remember, it was a it was a diversity colleague or someone that had posted on their facebook the after amy cooper incident and you did a teach me tuesday when yeah. you're teach me tuesdays and you made a it was a very practical statement about like how many of us know that somebody like that is in the boardroom, thus creating more marginalization in organizations. And it resonated with me. And you didn't say it like that, but you, the messaging of how that bias plays in to our community and organization. And I just started following you more. And then I started to see your book was coming out. And I started following you more on the Teach Me Tuesdays. And you and then everything that happened with George Floyd and I was like she's challenging my thoughts because I I was taking it at first as I had done everything wrong right but I I wanted to see how I can navigate it by with helping Mm. and not to feel so guilty from it yeah and I was like how and you you challenged me in a way to help navigate those thoughts settle into the guilt a little bit, Mm -hmm. but don't, don't stay there. Mm -hmm. Like move away from it. And here's how you can help shine a light for those who are unrepresented. And that helped me kind of set a chart, a course this past year of how, how can I get my shit together first and then educate myself on how I can be better at creating spaces that are safer and more belonging for those who don't look, act like me. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm grateful that the universe brought us together because I think my life has been enriched for sure. (laughs) Thank you. Um, When I think back to the Amy Cooper, Christian Cooper event in New York City, Central Park, it was so disheartening to me, mostly because if people had not seen it on video, Mm -hmm. they would have believed Amy. Mm -hmm. And I know people in all kinds of industries who have had Amy Cooper's to Amy Cooper them. Mm -hmm. And the entire system believes uh, the person who is making the claim. And I think until you have been wrongly accused of something, Mm -hmm. you don't understand the gravity of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But when I say that, I mean me too. Mm -hmm. Uh, It wasn't until someone filed a lawsuit against me that was wholly untrue Mm -hmm. that I had an appreciation that there are people who will completely make things up. And if they believe that they have the institutional power and control behind them, Mm -hmm. they don't even think that there's any possible way that they could could lose. But what I thought was even more interesting was that after Mm -hmm. she had consequences for her actions, there were still people coming out to say, cancel culture. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. So it, it was very interesting that we did not as a collective think that she should have any consequences mm-hmm. for such egregious actions. Mm-hmm. And it's not like she's going to jail. Right. Right. You know, she just has to get a different job or maybe <laughs> not be in such a high position of influence. Mm-hmm. And still she had lots of support. Mm-hmm. Which we have safely navigated not having jobs. Yeah, <laughs> yes, we have. And and had to get new ones mm-hmm. uh, for lots of different reasons. So. Yeah. And y- so I like you spoke a little bit on the the holy in in your book. Mm-hmm. You there's three, correct? Mm-hmm. Holy W H holy H O L Y. And I I want to kind of speak to that and sure. kind of get into the book. Let's do it. Tell me tell me what what your badassness through this because it I I can't relate because of the differences that we have but at the same time I could relate in how your brain was in that moment mm-hmm. and how your spirit was in that moment you know I, th- I think the book has been really interesting uh, because I've written for work a lot mm-hmm. and I write for work through my work experience through things I've studied and Honestly, I can take critique about my work writing really mm-hmm. easily because if you think differently, show me the evidence-based proof right. you have that a different approach will work. This was different. You know, uh, March 11th, I lost 21 speaking engagements in two days because of the global pandemic. And so all of a sudden, you know, I went from traveling three, four days a week to I didn't have anything to do <laughs> Yeah, I was trying to be benevolent and give like talk to my clients virtually coach co- virtually do trainings virtually. But everyone was at such a spot of influx. They didn't know what to do that. I just did not have one thing that I could do. So this book had been on my heart and in my spirit for a while. Mm-hmm. And so I just sat down and knocked it out in about three weeks. And the words. Three weeks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Holy I wrote shit. it fast. Yeah. yeah, the words every morning I woke up, the words were coming to me. And the play on the words, uh, the title of the book is The Holy Educated Motherfucker. Yeah, And I talk about holy in many of the ways that most people think about it, some kind of spiritual connection. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I, t- I do a play on words, mm-hmm. holy, mm-hmm. W-H-O-L-L-Y, mm-hmm. and holy, H-O-L-E-Y. And the idea is that all of us have some purpose in the world holy. I, I try to think about words in the way that they are defined. Mm-hmm. And holy does not only mean some spiritual connectedness to, to God. It means living solidly in your purpose, too. Mm. And so I lean into that in the book. But also I highlight how all of our experiences, the good ones, mm-hmm. the bad ones, mm-hmm. the benign ones, that they all make us who we are and all help us live out our purpose today. Yeah. Like if not for the bad things in my life, would I be able to sit here and talk with you Mm -hmm. um, and have empathy and compassion with the bad things you've had in your life Mm. and through our shared trauma, be able to help people. Um, We needed that. Mm -hmm. And if you take that away, I don't know that I even have much to say that would resonate with people. Mm. So that's the the holy, the W-H-O-L-L-Y. And then holy, holes meaning empty spaces where there's no solid. And uh, that was important to me because when I matriculated through engineering school and then also when I worked in manufacturing as an engineer, and then when I was leading engineers and technical professionals, my personality is very much casual, open-ended, spontaneous, conceptual, big picture, all the things. I am not a rule follower. <laughs> and and those things are just don't agree with whatever box you mm. would put typical engineers in. Mm. And um, what I found fascinating was that people expect you to be as good in the things that you're good at, but also good in the things they're good at can you say that again people expect you to be good in the things that you're good at but they also expect you to be good in the things that they are good at gotcha. so good. <clears throat> if i am scheduled mm-hmm. now you need to be scheduled too but i can appreciate the fact that you're casual and open-ended and spontaneous and can at the drop mm-hmm. of a hat pivot 
but you also need to be scheduled. And those Mm -hmm. two things don't typically come together in the same person. Now, there are exceptions to the rules, of course, but the person who can find the Nats level of detail problem is also probably not going to be your amazing strategist. And I'm speaking in sweeping generalizations, of course, but I was trying to get people to understand that for all humans, there's good things about us and bad things about Mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And we over focus on the bad things about Mm -hmm. us, the holes. Yeah. And the holes prevent us from being able to live full lives and help other people. Yeah. And so I wrote a little book about let let me show you the holes in my life Mm -hmm. and how I have navigated and still been able to live out my holy purpose. Yeah. Um, anyway, and what's been fascinating is I, when I wrote the book, I do think that I was writing as if I was talking to my best girlfriends. Mm-hmm. But what has been amazing is that men and non-binary people mm-hmm. have been my greatest um cheerleaders Mm -hmm. and this work and I've been surprised by that actually I don't know why still I think I do do you know why I have no idea why I think I do um I feel like and you you uh follow me down this this thought hole here (laughs) okay I'm gonna follow holy w-h-o-l-l-y um adverb entirely fully I kind of took that as That's the, that's the authenticity side. That's the authentic side. Mm -hmm. You know, the holy H O L E Y was the flawed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Great. We're all flawed in some Mm -hmm. way. Great. Get Mm -hmm. over it. Mm -hmm. But what resonated, because in my mind, I was always shamed, Mm guilt. And I know uh, uh, the wonderful Joe Barrett, a good friend of yours will be here to kind of spotlight a little bit of, of that as it rested with me and, and, and some similar stories in his, but the, the authenticity and what, what it did is like, how do I get over this guilt and shame and knowing who I authentically am as a gay person? Mm-hmm. And this is when, and I was reading it and I, I love the fact that you're an engineer. Cause I could see your 30,000 foot angle, <laughs> how you looked at things and, when I would go in and work with organizations about how they can acquire talent in the most diverse and belonging way. And so you took that and I I thought, and at the time I was really going through this self awareness journey and you put, if I could do a redo, I would likely take it or so I think. But when I evaluate what I have learned, what I have gained, how my life is better, stronger, kinder and gentler I ditch that thinking I embrace and accept the life I have as the beautiful one I have been blessed to live yeah and I was in you were I was in. hooked you were I in. was like she she gets it you know when I think about the experiences that you've just the only one the ones you've shared with me I'm sure there are many more but can I truly help and empathize with a person living in a rural community who is kind of gender neutral, um, certainly gay, left out. I don't know why that makes me laugh a little. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe it's because you're gay. You're it happy. Is, I'm like, yeah, when I say like, the word, it I'm makes here. it's a happy yeah. word. <laughs> it is a happy word. Who is who better to pour into the heart of mm-hmm. that young person? Me or you? And in some ways, people would argue, well, we both can. But I can from an objective outside view. Mm -hmm. You can from an empathetic inside view. Mm -hmm. And I think both views are important. And sometimes we don't know Mm -hmm. the value of our trouble until it's time for us to be able to support someone else who's going through the same thing. Right. And when I think about the death of my parents, um, I talk about the death of my dad in the book, not not so much the death of my mother. But before I had that experience, um, I don't know that I understood how important Mother's Day is actually far more important. That very first Mother's Day Mm -hmm. after you've lost a mom Mm -hmm. than 
being at the funeral when everybody's there. Yeah. But that's not something I would have known or understood. Somebody could have told me. I probably would have forgotten. And um, I think the more that we all open up to be more authentic about those pain points in our lives, um, that it allows space and, and opens it up for everybody. Mm-hmm. And shame and guilt are keeping us from our shared humanity. And I know that's kind of a foo-foo theoretical way to talk about mm-hmm. this, but that in the, at the heart of it is what we're dealing with inside organizations mm-hmm. every day. Mm-hmm. I am dehumanizing. I am trying to separate. I am trying to take a logical, reasonable, objective view of everything as if people are not at the end of these data points. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I like that you're you're taking the feeling away. Let's like not the feeling of it, but but you're taking the. um, Oh, I I want to find. There's an idea and a thought I have here, but you're taking the in my mind, the discomfort feeling away, it's like, we all have it. Mm-hmm. We all, but there's a, there's a parallel between, uh, Nicole's story and Clint's story that provides a way that like, Hey, here, here's how we can do it. together. Mm-hmm. The sum of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a book I'm reading right now. And so means a lot. And I, I would tell all my listeners and, uh, anybody that I have following this, just this, this is not only your story. It provides a mindfulness base application to just how we're and how you can navigate through those anxieties and those awarenesses when we come uh, full circle to uh, facing our trauma and our fears. Yeah, you those, have a way to navigate through it. Yeah, those unthinkable moments. I, I actually even say in the beginning of the book that I don't think I'm interesting enough to write like a biography. That is not what this is. Um, this is... I have been through some pretty unthinkable Mm -hmm. situations. Here's how I navigated. These were some things that I have in my toolbox. Mm -hmm. You might want to add a few of them to your toolbox. Mm -hmm. There are other, other thought partners, other leaders, other um, philosophers you might already believe in and buy into, but there's some decent ideas here that I don't think you don't have to learn them by living them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, you can, maybe adopt a few of them before mm. you have to go through the experience. So yeah. I've been very pleased. It's uh, the, the people are buying more of that yeah. than they are things I've studied to the doctoral level, which is fascinating because yeah. in some ways, if this feels like mm-hmm. my opinion, you know? Yeah. And I yeah. want to get into your, to your research and okay. I want to get into what you're teaching people because oh, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to want to breathe in. We're going to think a little deeper into it because I, I, I was like, whoo, we're going to get into it. But I, I, and I, uh, and I reached out to you cause I was, and I remember I, I said, I, she challenges my thoughts and I talked to my husband and I uh, told you some things about last year. And I said, I know our budget's what it is. I go, but I would like to, uh, I, I just, I want this person to teach me something. And you were so kind to open up and say, let me, let me help and, yeah. and open that up. And I, I wouldn't, I don't think comprehended as much from this without first going through uh, some stress reduction programming myself. Uh, I, I explained to you, I had read John Kabat-Zinn. Mm-hmm. I started reading more Eckhart Tolle to deconstruct a lot of the religious uh, doctrination that mm-hmm. was conditioned with me at a young age. And, um, and I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, it, had the same type of messaging for me, how you used your brain, your experience, you used your um, talent as an engineer to get you through Mm -hmm. these phases. And I'm like, that's what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. They're talking about go further back, get away from this frontal lobe ego area, go further back. Mm -hmm. That that's where you can connect down in the hole. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, take some, take a drink of water because um i want to (laughs) i'm ready to disrupt some stuff okay let's disrupt some stuff i want to disrupt so uh you tell us what you do tell tell what your passion is and then i i want to start talking a little bit uh, here recently when you talk about critical race theory Mm -hmm. and that just there's something there I want to know more yeah. about it. And I think it's just so critical right now as we're navigating back into organizations and community and getting back connected with one another uh, socially. 
Yeah, so what do I do? You know, my my name, Nicole, means victory for the people. Hmm. And um, hmm. I think that's what I that's what I do. I work that's inside nice. organizations. <laughs> I, I call myself an internal activist, which I'm not actually internal, right? But um, the people who have decision rights call me and say, how do we help our organization be more inclusive and more equitable? Hmm. And I try to help them along that way, that journey. Um, some people are in drastically different places than others, but we specialize in the inclusive leadership. So how do the leaders create a climate whereby this, these things are possible? I'm a fan of grassroots efforts. I think mm -hmm. that they are important and no grassroots effort is ever going to get off the ground inside of a, a for-profit organization without leadership. Mm -hmm. Uh, supporting it so we focus on inclusive leadership and we do that um, through helping people I have a trademarked um, coaching process called culturally responsive coaching where we help people get their diversity equity and inclusion plans in place mm. but we think our model is fabulous because we can do that in two days versus what typically people will do in six months now the downside of that is that's impressive from the HR is like two days two days yeah, yeah. But there's a downside. The downside is that me and my thought partners are no more um, intelligent about your organization at the end. Mm -hmm. We believe in asset-based thinking where our clients know the answers to their own questions. We just have to help remove interference and help them pull that out. Nice. So through the series of questioning, we get a sense of what the challenges are, what the strengths are, what the opportunities are, what aspirationally do we want to be able to get to. And we take the answers to those questions and craft the plan. So that's how we do it. Now, we walk away and we don't know any more about you. We haven't done one focus mm -hmm. group, right? So um, so that's part of it. But one of the other ways we do it is through training. Uh, but to, unlike other diversity and inclusion practitioners, because I'm an engineer, so mm -hmm. my brain in some ways is kind of linear. Yeah, yeah. So while other people think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, racial equity, and all of it all together, we feel like racial equity is like calculus and most US employee US employees have more like a pre algebra level of understanding at best. I, I like yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like what that. we do is we say, okay, if we're gonna start with pre algebra, let's talk about diversity in ways that are not intellectually challenging, not emotionally charged. Personality. Personality. Okay. Not too many people get upset about personality. Age, not too. Can you say like emotionally charged? I like because you say yeah. That again. So not intellectually challenging. So I feel like race, not a feel. Race is intellectually challenging for most yes, people to okay. get their heads around, and it's also emotionally charged. Mm -hmm. Everyone has an opinion about race. Not everyone has an informed opinion about race. Gotcha, gotcha. So we teach concepts of like prejudice, discrimination, um, oppression, covering all those things mm -hmm. around topics that people don't get too upset about. Um, think age. Okay. Think um, where were you reared? Rural versus country. Gotcha. Think departments, okay. IT versus finance mm -hmm. versus marketing, okay. and some of those in groups that get formed. Surface little, yeah. Yes. So we teach the concepts with the things that are not that intellectually challenging. Mm -hmm. Then we progress to what we call culturally responsiveness, which is are you culturally destructive or are you unaware and destructive? Are you culturally competent or are you culturally proficient? And we use the word culture very broadly. Mm -hmm. um, so there are all kinds of cultures, you know, uh, cultures within the LGBTQ community, mm -hmm. cultures within different organizations. But we have people evaluate themselves on a rubric of where they fall. And most people want to say that they're culturally competent, almost proficient. But I push because are you, though? Yeah. That, you know, how how do you treat people when they show up as their authentic selves if they don't fit into your norms around what gender means? Yeah, because that's a big statement. You better back it up. You better back it up. And so when you look at the rubric and what the actual words on the paper say, mm -hmm. um, many people are in a destructive zone, even around some things like age, um, weight, for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and... Um, we tr we what we hope at the end of that session is that people understand that this is not about celebrating difference. This is about understanding that my life 
is not as fulfilled Mm -hmm. if I don't know and and appreciate and leverage the differences of other people's lives that I am losing something. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And then the third and final session is um, is our racial equity session. We still think it's a prerequisite to deep work like a critical race theory. Mm -hmm. But by the time someone has finished our three sessions, we find that they're not nearly as resistant to content around critical race theory. And that's the goal. What I think is wrong with traditional HR programs is something major happens like what happened with George Floyd or Breonna mm-hmm. Taylor last year. And then everyone wants to talk race and they do, they ha- do they even know how to add and subtract using mm-hmm. my math analogy? Um, you know, just so many dominant narratives that are damaging mm-hmm. like, Oh, you know, I grew up in New York. So, mm-hmm. you know, we accept everybody. Well, say that to Eric Garner. Yeah. Say that yeah. to Christian Cooper. Yeah. Oh, I, you know, I lived in California, so, you know, we're far more open. Say that to the little five-year-old boy who was at Aspire Public Schools with handcuffs on, you know. And I think when we tell ourselves that somehow the South is worse than other parts of the country, we are delusional. Um, Mm. It is shown, racial issues are showing up differently all throughout the, the nation. And while the holy educated motherfucker is not necessarily about um, racial equity or diversity and inclusion. It is not a book. I did not, I said this too. Yeah. I did not write it for business people. Mm-hmm. But what it does is helps people to see that I am a walking diversity. Yeah. And that's why I think I'm better at helping to bring people along on the topic mm-hmm. because in a singular day, I can be in a, um, a local county jail mm-hmm. and then I can also be on a private jet of a local business owner. Mm-hmm. And to have that kind of difference in your life. Like I'm Christian, Christian, big C Christian. Right. And here we are here together. And I hope that I have never made you feel othered in my Christianity. And most of my Christian friends cannot say the same. That's huge. Yeah. That's, that's which part of it. Most of my Christian friends can't say the same. Yeah. Cause you, you, you I see that you, you kind of took this look, this moment, like, wait, I, I don't align to this, but I, I, that's not exactly what the whole Christian God meant. I'm going to step a little bit further forward as to what I think. And so it, that helps me where you, where you're saying you separate a little bit. It's like, I'm Christian, but you make me feel more welcomed in it. Yeah. You make me feel like I belong a little more in it instead of shaming me. Yeah. From it. Well, and then it's like, to me, there's nothing to shame you from. Yeah. yeah. Um, Cause I'm H O L E Y too. You're I'm H too. and you're <laughs> and you're H O L Y to uh-huh. me, and you're W H O L L Y to mm-hmm. me. Yeah. And um, I talk about this in the book. Faith is not factual. When I think about, um, I <laughs> I say this often when I when I do my sophisticated rants on Friday called Filter Free Friday. A sophisticated it, rant. My sophisticated rants. <laughs> Hashtag. If someone wants to disagree with me. Mm-hmm. I'm happy for them to disagree with my opinions. But when I'm presenting Mm -hmm. unadulterated facts, Mm -hmm. you can't agree or disagree with facts. You can only disprove facts or prove them. Mm -hmm. You can't disagree with facts. Is it 72 degrees outside or not? Like you can't disagree (laughs) with that. You know, like the only way you can disprove that is to go outside with a thermometer and come back with a different temperature. But otherwise, there's no agreeing or disagreeing with that. And so I think I faith for me has always been not factual Mm -hmm. by Mm -hmm. definition. Faith is just the thing for me that helps Mm -hmm. me get through this thing called life. And if faith is not factual, why would I be so emphatic about my faith excluding someone like that? That part for me does not make sense. That's a that's a spine chill that goes up. Yeah. That's a spine chill. And I just think, you know. We understand God or the universe just as much as these puppies understand me. Mm-hmm. And to to really dig in so deeply, mm-hmm. um, it just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. And many preachers have also read um, my book and they have all been complimentary. I've gotten um, some invitations to some some churches. Even mm-hmm. they, they have requested that I say mf instead of motherfucker, which is reasonable. Right. Um, Cause you don't want to swear in the house of no, the Lord. Pastor, I won't be there. I'm not coming <laughs> censoring my speech. 
How dare you <laughs> censor my speech? I'll say what the hell I please. Thank you. No. <laughs> Just kidding. No, no, please don't kid. That was wonderful. <laughs> Kiss my ass. Kiss my ass. <laughs> I'm gonna say motherfucker at the pulpit. I don't care. I'm gonna care. God knows I curse. I love it. Damn you, me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know Whew. it's um tapping in some of my roots I here. I gotta stop. I know. <laughs> I gotta stop it. But you know, I had a conversation with a, a pastor who I, I honestly I don't know him well. I just grew mm. up admiring uh-huh. the way he preached. And he had a fall from grace, a public fall from grace. It was all over the newspapers. Um, I'm, I, we, I know. You know who it is? Um, could we say it's out of Tulsa? No, no, nope, nope, nope. Yeah, we, know- we, let's say, we can okay. say, let's say it's out of Tulsa, yes. Let's say it's out okay, of Tulsa. Okay, it's out of Tulsa. Out of Tulsa. And he read my book, and he said what resonated with him was that his best friends in the ministry, when he was going through that, wouldn't even take his call. That's so Christian, right? And I invite people to think about how do we show up like that in other areas of our lives? You know, when somebody gets in trouble at work, what happens? Mm -hmm. Everybody just kind of separates themselves from them. We've seen the people who are on the cut list when we're getting ready to do um, severance packages. Yeah. They're the ones that, you know, now people are not talking to them like they have the scarlet letter written on them. And why do we do that? Why do we do that? Maybe it's, we don't know what to say, um, but in our shared bottoms, mm-hmm. uh, there's some some things that can, I think, bring us together in our shared humanity. Yeah. And he was just saying that the book really uplifted his spirit and helped him to think back, think through again what mm-hmm. his ultimate purpose is. Because if we could be more honest about these things, we we all have things that if someone were to shine a mm-hmm. spotlight and have the camera rolling mm-hmm. throughout our entire lives that we might not be so proud of. It's a great way to work it from like, if there was real, yeah. The, yeah. Again, we're like, we can't argue. Yeah. It's I all t- there. I tell a story about, um, there's a group of friends who, you know, before pre COVID, <laughs> we used to have these huge summer parties and it's that hot. Sounds fun. It's hot in the Midwest, right? Uh huh. And the younger, hot and humid, sticky. Hot and humid and sticky. And the younger you are, your legs tend to look nicer. Again, I'm speaking in <laughs> sweeping generalizations, right? When you're young, your legs are hot. And the older you get, you know, the, the, the knees just kind of—I don't know—they get. <laughs> I don't know what happens. They're just not not quite. I don't know. And you can't work out. They the, weren't where what they were at 27. No. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, I noticed f- friends and some of whom aren't that old going, oh, my gosh. I mean, why is she wearing such short shorts? Well, because she's 19. You know, it's like when you have nice legs, you wear short shorts. Yeah. But here's what's fascinating. They seem to forget that when they were 19, they wore short shorts. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, I have video of you in <laughs> you know daisy dukes and if you know if you're old enough somebody's got a picture of you somewhere in some hot pants Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so what does it look like for us to stop going back in history rewriting it in our favor and then saying oh my gosh and you and i've had conversations Mm -hmm. about this Mm -hmm. you know when people are not doing something right air quotes over here around issues of diversity and inclusion or racial racial equity the best way to bring them along that journey is to say you know at one point I thought this or at one point I did this mm-hmm. and so I get it mm-hmm. and let me give you a different perspective to yeah. consider mm-hmm. and let's get curious together and try to bring you along. So I don't know. I That, I, that, that for me was so healing because I was still acting from my trauma. I was mm. still acting from my victim my my being the victim Mm. and you you did you helped me you allowed me to settle in to see it from a different perspective that it can help others so you did you helped me in those discussions that we had you helped me see it in a different way and I was like oh I get it now I get it I mean most of us are not going to learn something from somebody yelling at us cussing Mm -hmm. at us screaming at us embarrassing us Mm -hmm. I mean I have learned some lessons that way but I prefer not to learn them that way (laughs) 
<laughs> it I hurts prefer, a little bit. Yes, things a little I prefer, bit more. I prefer not. Ugh. Well, I want to. So I want to talk about critical race theory. Uh-huh. I want to because I, I think we uh, can provide uh, you know the the story, some lighter stuff when it comes to how we can uh, just improve some basic concepts. But let I want to dive into the critical race theory okay. and what. What is critical race theory? We'll just start there. Well, that's a good place to start because many times when people have an opinion about critical race theory, they have no idea what it is. No. <laughs> um, so in, in short, it started in the legal community. Um, lawyers were trying to make sense of the law and how it d- does or does not support black people, really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's three tenets of critical race theory. The first one is that racism is hard to address because mm-hmm. we don't want to acknowledge it. Mm-hmm. And I, it's rare that I find a person who would disagree with that. I mean, right now we have um, House Bill is at 852 here in Missouri where we're trying to say don't teach uh, students in K-12 through education about race, racism, yeah, and the history yeah. mm-hmm. of race. So that's one tenet. The second one is... That For the, first, okay, first tenant is that racism is hard to address because we will not acknowledge it. Okay, no acknowledgement. Okay, okay. The second tenet of critical race theory is that racism is hard to address because it appears to benefit some people. Okay, so there are people in certain groups who appear to benefit. Now, I believe this is just Nicole's belief that. Actually, racism is hurting all of us. I believe Mm -hmm. if I just might use one practical example, if the cure for cancer is sitting in some dilapidated, underfunded school because there's black kids there, racism is hurting all of us. (laughs) But whoa, 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 whoa. That's huge. If there so if there's this kid because I I have worked with inner city, if there there's this kid, you know, right there who's not getting that nurturing of what that brain is capable of. And that kid is the one who can help us figure out the cure to cancer. Is it just black people who are not benefiting from that? Or is it all of us who's not, who are not benefiting? And I'm like, it's all of us who are not benefiting. That That is to me the right now that massively expands so much for me yeah. and my thought and how I see the race. Yeah. Cause I'm like, if we can, and lever- the systems, it's not about leveraging blackness or brownness or, minority groups because it's a charitable thing to do or because it's the right thing to do or because it's the morally right thing to do. It's like, no, we are losing something yeah. because the brilliance of that community is not being nurtured in the same way. Mm-hmm. So, but the second tenet of critical race theory is that it's hard to address because there are people who are benefiting from racism. Benefiting from it. And then the third tenet mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. that racism is ridiculous because race has no biological significance from a genetic standpoint. Race is only as um, significant as eye color or hair color Mm -hmm. or height. Mm -hmm. Those are the three tenets of critical race theory. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's it. Yeah. Now, some of the the legal things that have been talked about in there are, uh, let's say, I am at work and Nico is discriminating against me. Mm Mm-hmm. But Nico is not discriminating against black men. Mm-hmm. And Nico is not discriminating against white women. So the law, as it's written, from a race standpoint, well, Nico is not discriminating based on race because Nico doesn't have any issues with black men. Right, right. From a law standpoint, Nico is not discriminating because Nico is not discriminating against uh, uh, f- white women mm-hmm. so he does not have an issue based on gender right. it's the intersection for me of mm-hmm. both race and gender that Nico has a problem with and there's no law that addresses that wow and so critical race theory says well we can't fix that because we won't acknowledge it mm-hmm. um, it appears to benefit some people and in mm-hmm. this instance black men white men and white mm-hmm. women are benefiting from the system as it is. And three, this is stupid because it has no biological significance on whether or not I can do my job. Right. right. That's critical race theory. Right. And what, and 
from that, and then you start having now. Why is that? Why is Nico like that? Sorry, Nico, we're not throwing. Yeah, what it's and that's where you you are a master of the understanding the the bias right how that structure Mm -hmm. and being an engineer how that creeps in and how it plays out. And Nico might have conscious reasons for doing that, Mm -hmm. but more likely than not, um, I find that most of the people I work with are very kind, well-meaning people who have no knowledge of their biases, taking me back to the first tenet of critical race theory. Racism is hard to address because we will not acknowledge it. People won't even take the implicit association test that Harvard has that gauge unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. And so, again, how do we address it? Mm -hmm. And so I, I... I would like to say that I'm surprised, but nothing really surprises me these days anymore. I'm disheartened and disappointed that many of the people that I hear say, well, you don't teach critical race theory, do you? When I ask back, well, what tenets of critical race theory are you talking about? Mm -hmm. They haven't, they don't know. They just, the words, three words together Mm -hmm. have just been triggering for people. And they're like, no, don't bring that here. Yeah, it's not surprising. It's not surprising. But if I'm not, I'm not a Buddhist, right? But if somebody said to me, Nicole, do you teach Buddhist philosophy? Well, kind of. I mean, I teach you, I teach people that Mm -hmm. suffering is optional, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) That did, Mm -hmm. you know, so it's strange. It's um, humans. I love humans and humans confound me Mm -hmm. every day. Yeah. You and I, I. Your badassness to me is you settle into the fact like they're going to stereotype me, let them stereotype Mm -hmm. me. How do you, how do you manage that? How do you step out of it with such grace and eloquence with, with meaning? How do you settle in to the Mm -hmm. stereotypes and the assumptions that you, I know you're aware that people make of you. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I think I learned it the hard way because I used to twist and bend and turn and try Mm -hmm. to adjust my language, adjust my hair and be thinner and talk with a higher voice so that people would feel comfortable. And then once I realized that I was still not going to be able to get a seat Mm -hmm. at the table or when I did get a seat at the table, I was going to get a seat at the table with a broken chair that I still was going to be treated unfairly. I might as well be me Mm -hmm. if at the end of the day, I'm still going to get maltreatment. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, it, it boils down to kind of one line that I got out of Ta-Nehisi Coates, his book called uh, Between the World and Me. Ta-Nehisi Coates, Between the World and Me. Between the World and Me. He's talking to his son and he's, his hope for his son is that he would be able to show up in the world and be authentically himself. But he says, Cause all that twisting and turning and bending ain't going to help no way. And guess what? It's not. It's not. So if somebody's not going to like you for your inauthentic self, mm-hmm. you might as well be your authentic self and have them not like you for who you really are. Yeah. Uh, because there are plenty of people who will um, love and embrace and, mm-hmm. and your message will be helpful to them. So, you know, I welcome all voices to help us mm-hmm. progress in the struggle Mm-hmm. Um, because there are people who will listen to you. There are people people yeah. who will listen to me. There, you know, we do, yeah. we just need more people working on this because silence is violence. Can we hashtag that? Oh, I think it already is. That it's ain't gotta mine. Be. Okay. <laughs> it's gotta be. How do you, do you see the shift? Do you do you see the shift in our? In this last year, we've all taken a major pivot. How could we not? Mm-hmm. And we see evidence of people resigning organizations, the mass exodus. You know, there's mm-hmm. been some articles uh, from the New York Times to the Society of HR Management, LinkedIn, have put out like, you know, we need to prepare. People are not returning back. And I was like, trust has been broken. And mm-hmm. we see these things. Yeah, now, people have you- been surprised that the companies they thought were so stable yeah. just turned their backs on yeah. them when the times they were like... <laughs> And it's the same thing with the church. Oh, yeah. We see a mass exodus from these religious fundamental institutions. institutions. And I like that you call them institutions. And I, I've had a really this last year, institution, institution. 
because it helps me structure what that is and, and, and that, but are you seeing a shift? Are you seeing a shift to people coming to more awareness? Cause I, I see through my HR colleagues, my diversity colleagues, just, just this fatigue and I, I can't help. And I'm like, there's a path forward. Mm -hmm. And, and I kind of wanted to talk a little more on the, the hope side. Like, do you see the shift? Do you see it coming together? Yeah. So I'm an eternal optimist and I'm a present day realist. Eternal optimi optimist, present day realist. realist. I like that. And in short, that just means I am hopeful, but mm -hmm. I don't use hope as my strategy. Okay. So I'm always hopeful mm -hmm. that we are going to be able to turn the tide on this thing. Mm -hmm. Always hopeful. It, it helps me get up every day. <laughs> In the same regard, though, I can't help but remember that when Rodney King got the shit beat out of him in L.A. and we all watched it on television, mm -hmm. there was this mad ac exodus and people were in an uproar and they were like, whoa, they're going to do something different. And what tends to happen is that every time there's racial progress, mm -hmm. usually sparked by some event, then it gets followed by pretty strong anti-regression. Yeah, yeah. And I and it's happening right now. And it is not, I, tr I hate to put it in political terms, but so mm -hmm. many of these things have been politicized these mm -hmm. days that you have a conservative movement, and I'm using the term conservative in terms of keeping things the same, not mm -hmm. politically, where people are really frustrated mm -hmm. and angry that police officers are being held accountable, mm -hmm. that they cannot say whatever mm -hmm. they want to say um, inside workplaces, that playing fields have been leveled. We have to remember there are people who feel like they are losing mm -hmm. in this game. Yeah. And those people are working feverishly to turn people, turn things back to how they were. Now, here's the challenge. Clinton Shane. Clinton Shane, okay. Is this my call to action? This is the call to action. Okay. Everyone who's fired up right now needs to have their anti-regression strategy in place. Anti-regression strategy, strategy in place. Okay. As soon as when you start losing donors, when mm -hmm. you start losing customers, when you start losing members, mm -hmm. what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? So are you going to go back to what you were doing before? Freak you know, out. You, or, yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> as soon as we get one a piece of legislation passed, mm -hmm. are you going to go back to what you were doing before? I liken it to being mm. on a bicycle. You know, those of us with progressive ideas, you know, we were like, yes, let's get this garden going. Yeah. I've got this in that Go book, Cultivating mm -hmm. Culture as a Garden. Mm -hmm. But well-meaning progressives, what we like to do is once the garden looks all pretty, we're like, oh, give me my lemonade. Let me kick my feet up this week. Child. <laughs> You're right. You're we right. have a right. Yes, we're good. We're, we're good. good. Yeah. And when someone comes and says we have more work to do, this this happened right after marriage equality uh -huh. was passed. Trans mm -hmm. folks were saying, hey, listen, what about us? We're still mm -hmm. getting killed out here in the streets. Black queer people mm -hmm. were still saying, what about us? We're still mm -hmm. getting. Mm -hmm. And even here locally, the Mid American LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce was like, well, we don't need the social justice component of our mission anymore. Oh, right oh, after mm -hmm. marriage equality mm -hmm. was passed. Mm -hmm. And now look where we are. Yeah. Yeah. Trans people getting kicked out of the military. Mm -hmm. Whole states deciding that, yes, mm -hmm. you can fire people based on sexual orientation. That's regression. That's regression. That's that regression. regression. Right. And so when you are when when you're on the upswing and things are going well, mm -hmm. how do you go from good to great? Mm -hmm. You cannot just settle in at good because there's there's a force mm -hmm. that's pulling you back. And if you're not aware of that force, you're going to find yourself back having the same battles, same fights over and over again. And I'm just old enough now. Freaking unfortunate. Well, That's huge. It's good to be old. But when you get old, you, you've I've seen now three of these cycles. Yeah. And it's like, yes, I'm hopeful because we are humans. We are not just regular old animals who cannot think beyond what's in front of us. We know what this cycle looks like. We can interrupt it. Mm -hmm. We can mm -hmm. interrupt it. I believe that. Yeah. I'm hopeful. Yeah. And I I always kind of, I told, I was talking, I uh, had the wonderful uh, Dr. Genesic to talk to me about listening, which was good. And since you are my mentor and my listen. executive coach, did she really? Because 
I, I gotta tell you, because you, you when I reached out to her, and I, it, it, to me, it was no coincidence that she was one of the first guests because it was like critical listening. I have word vomit, which you're well aware of, and uh, and so I have an opportunity. So I got got through that, and so she she was able to uh, help me through that part. And I, I I lost my train of thought with what I was trying you to. You didn't say mind her point. little. You didn't mind her assessment because I, I did not mind her. I did not mind her assessment okay. at, at all. I list- I, I, no, oh, it was the wound. So what happened is I was explaining to her kind of the wound of what you were explaining. Like we, we exposed a wound, right? Okay, great. We see the wound open. We have race issues. We have homophobic, transphobic issues. Great. Marriage equality is pl- passed. Stitch it. You know, we have to heal this wound now. now. There's like a mitigation after. Right. And so I... I was talking to my husband and about the word intention, Mm -hmm. you know, the law is passed. Now what's the intention? And so Mm -hmm. uh, there's a medical term in it. My husband's a wound care specialist. And he was telling me, I was like, well, I go, what did that mean? Intention and wound care. And he was like, well, it's the, how you heal primary, secondary intention, primary, you stitch it up, put a little antibiotic, get back out there. Secondary intention. You have to let the wound heal from the inside out. Mm -hmm. It takes time. All these things. Uh I was like, and it kind of coincides to exactly what you're saying is like, okay, great. We ripped the bandaid off Mm -hmm. y'all. We've been covering this shit for too long. We got to heal it. Mm -hmm. And you come in as that wound care specialist within an organization Mm -hmm. to say, we we're going to have to get this clean it out. Mm -hmm. And I have the structure to make it a good, nice scarring with a nice story that you can tell. And listen, the cleaning out of a wound is Mm -hmm. not comfortable. It's so ugly. And people, we don't like to be uncomfortable. Mm-mm, mm-mm. So I think it's Michael Singer in The Untethered Soul says, you know, it's like having a thorn in your in your skin. And instead of pulling it out, you just put a bandage over yep. it. Mm-hmm. And so then every time somebody pokes it, mm-hmm. now you're mad at the person for poking it yeah. instead of let it, letting us get to the heart of the, the issue or the matter. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, in short, I'm hopeful. I would not get up and do this work every day if I didn't think it were possible to solve yeah. Um, and I am, I'm not Pollyanna about this. I see the challenges with it every mm-hmm. single day. Yeah. And I, it, you, you motivate me because you see that challenge. You see that next mountain. You don't have one mountain. I, oh. n- I don't see you as climbing one mountain. Oh, it feels like I'm, I don't know. You're and, like, I'm just climbing the next one. And then um, what's it called? Uh, um, the huge crater in the earth in the middle of the United States, so southwestern United States. Oh, the Grand Canyon. Yeah, I'm like in the <laughs> gra- the bottom of the Grand Canyon, like, oh, gosh. Uh-huh. Um, but that's why it's not just one person's work. Mm-hmm. You know, it's many people's work. And, you know, people will call, someone called today who's um, really careful about saying he was doing the same thing. I'm like, I'm one person. Mm -hmm. How many millions of people are there in the country? I would hope that more people are doing what I'm doing than just me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, I mean, I wear makeup. When Rihanna started Fenty Beauty a couple years ago, people were like, what? And then, I mean, and then there's space for her. Mm -hmm. You know, Uh there's space, there's space for more and more people to do this work. And there's some unique intersections. Yeah. Um, There's some unique challenges that, I can't address them all, Mm-mm. you know, language barriers, for example. Uh, I can't address yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Um, not all of them. But who among us don't understand if someone has a southern accent mm-hmm. that people internal prejudices say that mm-hmm. person's dumb. Yeah. Yeah. You're and if we right. don't want to look at that mm-hmm. and then evaluate what's going on with that and then recognize that somehow there's some people who benefit from that system, everyone mm-hmm. who does not have an accent and then understanding that accents have no biological significance. Basically that's critical race theory, but related to accents. Right. And right. so that's what we do. We teach people about these kinds of complex theories and ideas in ways that they won't be mm-hmm. triggered so right. they can learn it. And it's at the intersection of where we all are individually. Mm-hmm. What would you want? Uh, you give us, you've given us the call to action. You've given me the call to action. What do you want? The where does this come from? I read your book, but where? Why? What do you? What do you do this? What? Where, where's the core? I, and I, I say it because I got my, got my, uh, my daughter, my donor, my donor kid up here. Cora. That's your donor kid. Yeah, 
And so why, where does this come from? Who do, who do you do this for? Why do you do this? And, and what would, what do you want our listeners mostly to, to gain from this? <laughs> this is where you're going to learn that I'm not an HR person. See, cause some HR person would have something really uplifting and inspiring to say right now. But for me, I love you for saying that so much. <laughs> Because <laughs> I got sent to HR to try to fix me, and it didn't. Oh, work. nice! Didn't didn't work. Well, you weren't doing so, your job then if you didn't go to HR. <laughs> what I want to do, what I love doing, is helping technical professionals be better leaders. That's actually how I got into the diversity space. Mm -hmm. HR people used to be like, well, you know, they're an engineer; they can't, you know, like mm -hmm. they're just going to be a bad leader. And that's when I realized that if you're going to be a good instructor, you have to be able to adjust your style. Mm -hmm. Um to in the way that people learn mm -hmm. but this work around diversity and inclusion was just something I was doing on the side you mm. know people would ask me about it at church community activists would ask me um to help them and I would and then one year um, I wrote a whole book about it lively paradox an authentic perspective on issues of diversity and inclusion where do I get that it's on Amazon. Okay, okay. You I don't have that one? Oh my no. God, that was my seminal work. Oh, okay, okay. But I wrote that book so people would leave me alone. I'm like, I don't <laughs> want to be the black person in the middle of Missouri or Iowa or Nebraska. There's your book. Leave me alone. Yes. And look, I wrote a training guide so you can take the book and have your reflective questions. You can teach this whole thing for $12.95. Like, leave me alone. Like, I was really trying to give it away. In fact, the training guide was free. Okay. I was like, just download the training guide for free. Just leave me. I wrote it to, so you could leave me alone. And then I had clients who just wouldn't take no for an answer. That's what they mm -hmm. wanted me to do. So there's a, um, a biblical story that I like to tell about Jonah. Jonah was supposed to go to this town called Nineveh. Mm -hmm. God was sending Jonah to Nineveh. Mm -hmm. Jonah didn't want to go because he didn't think the Ninevites deserved him trying to help save them. Mm -hmm. So Jonah's going to go someplace else, mm -hmm. gets on a different boat, all hell breaks loose on this boat. The people find out that Jonah's got some issue with God, didn't do what God say, so they pitch him overboard. Jonah ends, gotta go. Jonah ends up in the belly of a well uh -huh. and three days, and then Jonah, you know, comes to his senses yeah, and is it. like, okay, God, I'll go to Nineveh. That's the story I tell when I talk about how I got into diversity and inclusion. <laughs> I'm fucking Jonah, man. I don't want to do this. I've been in the belly of the whale. Like, oh, I have been there. I was like, I don't want to go to Nineveh. And God's like, yes, you will. So, you know, people mm. won't let me stop talking about yeah. it. So I finally just, in, you know, this is a strategy of mine, too. When the world wants something from me, uh -huh. um, there's many ways to deliver on your purpose. Yeah. One is the thing that you're just passionate about, but the other is the thing that the world needs from you and that you are just damn, damn good at. And <sighs> I'm damn good at it. Yeah. And the world wants it from me. Mm -hmm. So I'm over here helping the Ninevites, man. I love it. That's, <laughs> that's the story. You're leading the Ninevites. <laughs> I love it. And I came in the belly of a well. I love it. Well, how, how, how do people get connected to your badassness, to you, your yeah. purpose, all of it? How do they do that? Livelyparadox.com. Or you can follow me on social. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, all the things. I got a TikTok. My team will not allow me to get an OnlyFans, but I'm still working on that. Get me an OnlyFans page. Do you know what that is, Clinton Shane? I, I want to say it was, kind, it's kind of like the new grinder for, it's not a hookup. It's a little bit it's of a slight a, porn. Yeah, maybe? yeah, but it's not porn. You it know, isn't, you're teaching but I think it's, But did it start with? Yeah, but you're teaching things. You're teaching things. Well, Just in provocative well, you, you ways teach that people learn. In porn. Oh um, yes, but this is like, <laughs> you know, like, but I could teach diversity tips in ways that right. people would really pay attention. It's a platform. It's a platform. Yes, it's but my platform. team won't say yes. So, yeah. you know, at Lively Paradox on all okay. uh, social media channels, I don't have a business Twitter. I am use I use at Nicole D. Price is okay. my Twitter. Yeah. But yeah, so, you know, the holy educated motherfucker seems like it's a little incongruent, but it isn't. I wrote it for people who work in organizations mm -hmm. and not for the organizations. All my mm -hmm. other pieces of work are for the organizations. It's for the individual mm -hmm. to figure out how to navigate these systems. Yeah. 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 We're going to close this out because I would you, you you shut up my my home here and you gave me a gift yeah a lapel pin I don't even know wear them but lapel pin your, I'm going to now put it on your uh cowboy hat yeah oh my gosh yeah uh the life you have is the only life you have to live sugar yeah 
I love it. And you call me sugar. I love it. Hey, I love sugar. it. I love it. And my, I was telling you, I was like, my grandma would call me sugar. 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 She got her. She got to put, put that her in there. <laughs> well, it works for sugar. Don't yeah. use it in other terms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, y'all get connected, uh, to, uh, to our website, human realness podcast. Be sure to check out all, all the good things that, uh, Dr. Nicole Price is doing my friend, my mentor. And thank you so much for being here in my home. And thank you for putting up with the puppies right there. They absolutely love you. And I, I'm excited to explore all the things that you're just about to accomplish and the things that you're going to do to blaze a trail for the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. All right.